Our next speaker is Lisa Doyle, a PhD candidate in Trinity's Department of Classics and an early career researcher here at the Trinity Long Run Hub. She's working on the project Margins of Learning, funded by the Provost's Project Award Scheme, and her talk is titled A Woman in Crisis, The Boundaries Experienced by Medea. Take it away, Lisa. Hi, thank you, Connor. Can you hear me okay? Thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. And while I do, I'd also like to extend my thanks to the organizers, Tom and Alicia, and also to Kieran. It's such a pleasure to speak on a panel that opens with a poetry reading. I kind of wish that was always the case. <laughs> now, let me see if we can get that up. Dun, dun, dun. Great, you can all see that okay? Awesome, great, thank you. So yeah, in this paper, I will be discussing Medea, a renowned figure who, according to Greek myth, is a princess from Colchis, modern day Georgia, who helps Jason, the leader of the Argonauts, obtain the Golden Fleece so that he may return to his homeland as king. She marries Jason, they land in Corinth, Greece, where Jason decides to marry the king's daughter there in order to obtain better standing, and Medea goes on to commit filicide. Medea's story, despite being nearly 2,500 years old, provides us with an excellent case study to explore the themes of this conference and to examine the nature of oppressive boundaries and their implications in a crisis or a traumatic event. So I'm going to deal with two main texts today. The first is Euripides' Tragic Play, which was first performed in Athens in 431 BC. It's concerned with the events that took place when Medea returned to Corinth with Jason. The second text is the epic poem by Apollonius of Rhodes. So this is the same genre as the Homeric poems. It was written in the third century BC. So this is an important point. It was written after Euripides' tragic play, but it actually provides us with the backstory to what occurs in Euripides. So Apollonius tells us about the voyage of the Argonauts and the love story of Jason and Medea, and ultimately shows us how a young princess of Colchis, the granddaughter of the sun god, became the woman she is in Euripides, a woman driven to filicide. I want to begin and touch on uh, the reception of Medea. She is a character that has resonated with us throughout the centuries in art, literature, and numerous stage productions of Euripides' play. She's been embodied in more recent years by Fiona Shaw and the late Helen McCrory, with notable versions by Irish playwrights, such as Brendan Kennelly and Marina Carr. In these re retellings, the general themes of exile and abandonment associated with Medea, Medea remain relevant and powerful, but the contemporary Irish versions of Medea in particular explore gender issues and the position of women within Irish society. An important aspect of Medea's reception, <clears throat> pardon me, is the way she informed the depiction of another prominent mythological figure, one which has again inspired many interpretations and retellings, and that figure is Dido, the African queen and ruler of Carthage. She appears in the epic poem The Aeneid by the Roman poet Virgil. And what is especially relevant to our discussion is that the character of Medea in Apollonius's epic poem, which we will look at, is the predominant model for Virgil's Dido due to her psychological turmoil as an abandoned lover. So we would not have Dido as she appears in Virgil without Apollonius's landmark depiction of Medea. But I want to begin our analysis with Euripides' play. Um, the themes of the Medea, which we are about to discuss, were also explored by Euripides through other characters, such as Phaedra in the play Hippolytus. She also experienced boundaries and constraints of a political and ethical nature with catastrophic consequences, all because of a destructive love for someone, a love that was caused by a god, just like Medea. But our captivation with Medea and modern society and her resonance throughout the centuries very much stands in contrast to the initial reception of Euripides' play in the fifth century. It was performed in front of an all-male Athenian audience at the annual um, dramatic festival, the Dionysia Festival, and it came in last place. Um, one contributing factor for this might be that Euripides was the first author to introduce the detail that Medea um, killed her children. That did not exist in previous versions. But first, I would like to look at the boundaries that were already in place for Medea, introduced in Euripides' play, because of her marginalised status, which ultimately aggravate her crisis. Medea is the ultimate other. She is marginalised on account of her gender, her, far <clears throat> her foreignness. As I mentioned, she's Eastern, <clears throat> pardon me. And um, so she comes from Colchis, which is very much at the limits of the Greek's known world. 
She is also othered because of her witchcraft. She is knowledgeable in herbs and plants. She's a priestess for the goddess Hecate, who's associated with sorcery and magic. Another unofficial category, which really makes things worse for the men both in the audience and those who interact with Medea, is that she is incredibly clever and capable. When we meet her in Euripides' play, Medea is in the throes of crisis and extended trauma. It becomes clear to us, the audience and readers, that there are restrictive, exacerbating boundaries imposed on her due to the inequality perpetuated by the patriarchal society she lives in. Her famous monologue addressed to the women of Corinth attests to this, where she says, we women are the most wretched creatures and I would rather stand three times in battle than give birth once. To the ancient Greeks, Medea is a barbarian by virtue of the fact that she is non-Greek. She has crossed the physical border from her barbarian land to get to Greece. And when she arrives there, she has low social status. She is a non-citizen. The Athenians, and remember this play is being performed in Athens, they were quite restrictive about their citizenship. And I quote Karamanu here, the Athenians drew a tight line around their civic membership, posing a clear boundary between citizens and non-citizens. So Medea is a refugee. The Greek word used to describe her, I've included on the slide, is fugas, coming from the Greek verb fugo, meaning to flee. And she has actually been exiled from three places at this point, her homeland, Iolcus, which is Jason's Greek hometown, and Corinth, which is where we find her in Euripides' play. She faces the threat of exile as that play opens. So her predicament has been ongoing for quite some time before the beginning of the play, and she finds herself isolated and in a precarious position. And I'll just point out that quote on the slide here, addressed by the chorus to Medea, poor woman being driven from the land in exile and um, without honor. The Greek word atimos there, literally means ah without tima, without honor, but it may also mean without civil rights. So Medea here is someone who's been deprived of civil rights and the chorus are recognizing her legal predicament as they address her. So these um, parameters are put in place to ensure and maintain her marginalized status and they exacerbate her crisis and her behavior becomes more problematic as the play develops. She goes on to kill Jason's newly chosen wife, Glauke, and Glauke's father, Creon, who's the king of Corinth, before resolving herself to committing filicide. Now I want to look at a detailed account of Medea's mental response to her situation as found in Apollonius's poem and how that informs her behavior. And on that topic, our exploration of boundaries will also necessarily entail a discussion of transgressions. So with Medea, this transgressive behavior is not only apparent through her violent acts and her violent behavior, but also through her agency and her decision to untether herself from her family and cross the threshold of marriage to be with Jason, as well as her embodiment of male heroic values and behavior. So in Apollonius's poem, Medea appears in the last half, so books three and four. The depiction of her inner conflict is quite unprecedented in its detail. Apollonius shows us her psychological response and demonstrate how, demonstrates how her mental state prompts the behavior that we see in Euripides. As has been pointed out by Richard Hunter, in contrast to drama, the narrative of an epic poem allows a fuller exploration and depiction of Medea's psychology through action, gesture, simile and speech. So to remind ourselves, her anxiety is the product of her love for Jason. This love has been caused by a god, but it is met with a very human reaction and human concerns are prioritized um, in this poem. So Medea faces the tough decision between honoring the commands of her father, the king, who has forced Jason to participate in dangerous tasks, which will no doubt prove fatal to him. Or she can save the man she loves through her knowledge of sorcery by removing herself from the bounds of the oikos or her household and committing herself to Jason in marriage. So what does this anxiety look like? I quote Sanders who says that Medea's eros, her love, engenders a whole host of symptoms, psychological, physiological, or somewhere in between. Her dilemma permeates her psyche and manifests in physiological and behavioral symptoms. Apollonius in describing this response provides us with a recognizable and relatable depiction of someone whose mental health has been severely impacted by the situation she finds herself in. So I'll start by talking through some physiological symptoms. Apollonius um, takes inspiration from the great female lyric poet Sappho in describing how feelings of love, grief and pity present as physical symptoms. These symptoms include blushing, tears of course, 
Um, Medea develops a pain in the nape of her neck, which is essentially your occipital lobe. Um, and the ancient scholars commenting on this poem found that this de detail was really realistic. She also experiences this feeling of her heart dropping out of her chest. The second category I want to look at are her anxious thoughts. These thoughts lead to destructive logic as well as uncertainty as she flits back and forth between her decision over the right thing to do. So we are told that her thoughts move to and fro from her numerous troubles. She is anxiously debating and turning over her dilemma in her mind. And we are also told, I've included on the slide, that her noose, her mind was alo enclosed with cares or worries. As a result of her anxiety um, and her, her anxiety over her, her dilemma, this impairs her perspective. So she begins to mourn and lament Jason as if he has already died, even though the tasks have not taken place yet. This is reiterated by a simile in book three, which compares Medea to a grieving widow. So Medea is catastrophizing. She is visualizing scenarios in the future and her inability to handle them, which is a hallmark of anxiety. Sanders notes that in Euripides' play, Medea's emotions are presented separately, whereas in Apollonius, her emotions are very much in conflict. And this manifests in her uncertainty as she vacillates between decisions. Her behavior is uncertain, she is distracted, indecisive, and overwhelmed by her dilemma. Some examples of this include um, when she tries to go to her sister's bedroom after first meeting Jason to confess to her sister what she wants to do. She's constantly moving back and forth. She tries three times to cross the corridor to her sister's room, but stops herself each time. When Medea's sister actually seats Medea out, Medea can't articulate what's actually on her mind and speak her true concerns to her sister. I've included this on the slide. Apollonius describes her muthos, her speech, rising to the tip of her tongue, her glossae, and then fluttering back down into her stethos, into her breast. Similarly, she's deciding at one point whether to give the pharmaca, the drugs to Jason. These are the herbs and plants that will help him get through his tasks. But then she changes her mind. Later, she thinks perhaps she should hand the drugs over to Jason and then kill herself. But she changes her mind about that as well. Finally, she arrives at the decision, the decision to help Jason um, defying her father. An important thing to note is that Medea's strained mental state is the result of her crisis and of the boundaries that are designed to oppress her gender, which we've already discussed. However, the combination of the severity of her mental distress, she's overwhelmed and unable to make decisions easily, and the nature of her marginalized status serves only to create more, to more turmoil and the crisis continues to get worse. In deciding to help Jason, Medea becomes an active agent who defies the patriarchal system by defying her father and leaving his guardianship. So in ancient Greece and Athens, it was practiced that a woman had a kurios, a male guardian until marriage. She also targets the other male representative of her family and um, her half brother Absyrtus. In the fourth book and final book of Apollonius's poem then, the fallout from this crisis occurs at a personal and political level. Medea's family and people, um, the Colchians, are now in conflict with the Argonauts who have sailed off with the Golden Fleece. So the Colchians sail after them, led by her brother Absyrtus. They get cornered. So two of the significant acts are Medea's marriage to Jason and her decision to murder Absyrtus in order to escape successfully. Significantly, Medea's justification in deciding to kill her brother are the previous errors that she has already made up to that point. And I've included the quote on the slide there. So this is a sign that the situation is very much spiraling out of control. At this point in the poem, in book four, Medea experiences severe isolation from her home and isolation and separation from the crew of the Argo as they escape. In the same way that she begins to isolate the nurse and the chorus in Euripides' play as she ex executes her plan. I'd like to briefly diverge from our current discussion, if I may, to point out some moder modern theoretical readings of this part of the poem and other aspects of Medea's predicament. So Bayer reads Medea's isolation in book four from a narratological perspective, essentially. He comments that we are more distant from Medea in book four. We have less access to our inner thoughts. This ultimately creates a barrier between the poet, his audience, and the character of Medea. And this is very much in contrast to the third book and the insight we get into Medea's conflict there, some of which we have just looked at. Where according to Theodora Papadopoulou, Medea's third monologue especially cr crosses a narrative boundary. In this monologue, Medea's inner struggle peaks. 
and we are privy to the formulation of and rapid succession of her thoughts. And she is fully devastated by her inner debate as she comes to the conclusion that she must kill herself. This interior monologue, according to Papadopoulou, breaks the boundaries of the narrative, resulting in the structure and content of the poem interacting with one another. Another narrative feature I want to mention, um, which also illustrates symptoms of Medea, Medea's anxiety, is her dream. So we see this in book three of the poem. Um, she falls asleep after meeting Jason for the first time, and she imagines in this dream that Jason's reason for traveling to Colchis was to marry her, and that Medea herself performs these dangerous tasks successfully, but as a result, a disagreement arises between her father and the Argonauts as a result of her um, interference. Her parents become angered and grieved at her decision to choose Jason, and she is awoken from this dream by her parents' screams of grief. Sistaku tells us that in these dreams, the boundaries between reality and illusion are blurred. They reflect Medea's complex bodily and emotional state and indicate that her perception will be controlled by her, her emotions and anxieties. So if we return to Absyrtus in book four then, and to wrap up this discussion, as the male child, Absyrtus is the representative of the family. So moral law has been transgressed because of his murder and both Medea and Jason have committed blood guilt. By disobeying her father and marrying her father's enemy, Medea has untethered herself from security and severed ties with her oikos or household. So her thought process in book three, which we looked at, leads to her actions in book four, where she crosses the boundary of her familial ho home and commits transgressive acts. The decisions and actions which led her to that point result in the loss of kinship bonds creating more isolation and resulting in the imposition of more boundaries, which we see in Euripides' play. As Medea is physically displaced, she is not a citizen and has no familial security. So her response to her predicament and the restrictions caused by this patriarchal society manifests as recognizable and relatable behavior. She becomes overwhelmed and therefore keeps making mistakes and errors in judgment. She commits further more serious deeds based on the previous errors and tra transgressions she's already committed and as an attempt to resolve the situation with her crisis escalating out of control. So boundaries are one way of reading and interpreting her story as it appears in the text we've discussed. And this theme demonstrates the ways that Medea's experience of marginalization and mental turmoil can deeply resonate with a modern reader transcending the bounds of time. And with that, I will finish up and thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you. Let me just stop my screen. Thanks so much, Lisa. That was not only um, really interesting analysis classics wise, but also really good overview of a lot of the kind of ground we'll be exploring in the conference. So it was, again, uh, perfect to have that in the first. Thank first you so much. Yeah. Thank I think you, that was Very interesting questions from that.